Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake gave yourself up into the service of your parents, and to teach us true humility, carried by your mother into the temple, and there redeemed with the offerings of the poor, when the righteous Simeon and the prophetess Anna, gladdened by your presence, gave glorious witness concerning you. May the slightest breath of vanity never affect my innermost soul. May all arrogance be ever cast down. May all longing for the praise of men be extinguished. May all wantonness of self-conceit be quenched within me. Give me grace, O Lord, to flee any honour, to hate distinction, and to submit myself with readiness to all men for your sake. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who as a little child did with your tender mother suffer persecution and did not refuse to be carried as an exile fleeing into Egypt. Give me grace amidst the storms of adversity and the blasts of persecution and in misfortune to fly for refuge to you alone, to seek you, to call upon you, Grant that I may receive all things with gladness at your hands, may endure all things in meekness of heart, and may cleave with thanksgiving without wavering to you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you remained behind in the temple, your mother sought for sorrowing, and at length with joy found you sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing and asking them questions. May you so give and communicate yourself to me, that I may never be separated from you, and never be without the comfort of your blessed friendship. Drive sloth from my heart, dispel any dullness that is displeasing in, my, in your sight. Grant me perfect devotion, and such an ardent thirst after piety, that my soul may be so affected and possessed by it, as never to feel satisfied with worshipping you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, who gave yourself up to live in concealment for thirty years, to be reputed by the Jews the son of Joseph the carpenter, and be subject to the commands of your mother and the same Joseph. May your grace, I beg you, root out and thoroughly pluck up from the innermost recesses of my heart any ambition and seeking of glory that I may become belittled in my own eyes, and may love to be unknown and considered of no account, submitting myself to all, and obeying them for your honour. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who did not refuse to come to the River Jordan, and be baptised there by your servant John. May you thoroughly cleanse me by your merits in this life, that freed from all vices and sins, I may be filled with the love of you and long for my heavenly country. Make me, I beg you, before my soul quits this body, pleasing to you in all things, that, departing from this life, I may be for ever in heaven with you, to see you, to enjoy you, and to praise your holy name for ever and ever. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake dwelt in the wilderness amongst the wild beasts, and fasted and watched in prayer for forty days and forty nights, permitting yourself to be tempted by the devil, whom you overcame when angels came and ministered to you. Grant me grace to discipline, overcome, and bring into subjection my sinful flesh with its evils affect evil affections. Give me grace to be instant in prayer and all other spiritual exercises, and grant that with your continual help I may completely overcome sins of gluttony and may escape the snares and schemes of the devil. Let no temptations, I beg you, defile me, nor separate me from you, but may they rather purify me and unite and join me with you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to preach repentance, to call to you disciples, and from them choose the twelve apostles to be the especial heralds of the faith, 
gathering together the children of God that were scattered abroad. Draw me after you, and powerfully excite my heart to love you. Do not permit me to neglect the grace with which you called me, but make me ready to despise the world and all perishable things, following you, taking your humility and charity as my example. Give me grace to look for you alone, and with earnest longing to sigh continually after you. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9. Getting the twelve together, Jesus gave them power and authority over all evil spirits and over diseases to make them well. He sent them out to be preachers of the kingdom of God and to make well those who were ill, saying to them, Take nothing for your journey, no stick or bag or bread or money, and do not take two coats. If you go into a house, let that house be your resting place until you go away. If any people will not take you in, when you go away from that town, put off its dust from your feet as a witness against them. They went away journeying through all the towns, preaching the good news and making people free from diseases in all places. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about everything that was happening and he was thoroughly perplexed because some people were saying that John had been raised from the dead while others were saying that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had risen. Herod said, I had John beheaded but who is this about whom I hear such things? So Herod wanted to learn about Jesus. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowd found out, they followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, curing those who needed healing. Now the day began to draw to a close, so the twelve came and said to Jesus, Send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and food, because we are in an isolated place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They replied, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. Now about five thousand men were there. He said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. So they did as Jesus directed, and the people sat down with them. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and broke them. He gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. They all ate and were satisfied, and what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. Once, when Jesus was praying by himself and his disciples were nearby, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has written. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. He forcefully commanded them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, chief priests and experts in the law and be killed and on the third day be raised again. He said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, or, and loses or forfeits his own self? For whoever will be ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed, when he comes in his glory, on the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there are some of those who stand here who will in no way taste of death until they see God's kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said that when you become a follower of his, you leave behind your old self and prepare to travel light. 
First of all, you are forgiven. All that is past is gone and of no consequence. It is baggage you no longer have to carry, a burden that has been thrown away. It no longer matters what you did or who you were. You are now a full member of God's family. Second, the way ahead is in front of you. If you are walking a mountain path, continually looking over your shoulder, eventually you will fall and take a tumble down the mountain. So be bold. Strike out in confidence and live the first day of the rest of your life as a child of God, free of the burden of the past. Today we read of the state of confusion induced in Herod as a result of the stories reaching him about Jesus. These were not just accounts of the things that he had done, by him, done himself, but of those performed by his disciples. The teaching of Jesus and the miracles performed by him and in his name were a clear sign that not only did he have the power, but he could attribute power to those who chose to follow him. The power not of a mortal man, but of the Messiah himself. The fact that simple people, like the fishermen from Galilee, as opposed to the clever and sophisticated men from the temple of Jerusalem, were performing miracles as well, must have been doubly worrying from he for Herod. Not only was Herod confused, but also the people themselves, for they wanted to know what was happening. Although they could not concede that Jesus was the Messiah, they did at least want to find an honourable rationale for his power. First of all, they thought perhaps it was John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. And how distressing this must have been for Herod, his executioner. And then thoughts turned also to the return of Elijah or the resurrection of one of the old prophets from the past. Herod was in a difficult position. We are told that while he pondered that he had ordered the execution of John, this Jesus of Nazareth appeared a far more formidable opponent. Whilst John had preached, he had never performed a miracle, and here was Jesus doing both on a regular basis. Note that although Herod wanted to learn about Jesus, he was unwilling to go and seek him out. He would not have been so hard to find had he chosen to look. Though sadly Herod may have thought it below his status as a king to go to Jesus, the king of kings, despite his curiosity. Sometimes we can be a little like Herod in this respect. We are curious about our faith. We hope that perhaps Jesus might walk into our lives and then we could have a lengthy discourse with him and be truly converted. This is rarely the case. Jesus told us that those who truly seek will find. Those that truly thirst and hunger will find satisfaction. Those of us, though, who merely go through the motions of faith are unlikely to find anything. The feeding of the multitude is a well-known event from the Gospel. But before getting too far into looking at this in particular, let us take a moment to consider verse 11. When the crowds found out, they followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and cured those who needed healing. The disciples had just returned from their mission and no doubt were tired and wanted to spend some quality time with Jesus and to relax, which is why we read that they went away to a quiet place near Bethsaida. However, the crowd was anxious to find Jesus, so anxious that they sought him out and found him. Jesus made him welcome. This little passage makes me wonder how much we want to find Jesus. How hard are we prepared to look for him? Do we think we might find him if we go to church? And how often do people return from there disappointed? The truth is that we need to seek him out, just as these pe simple people back in the Holy Land sought him out and followed him from town to town, just to hear what he had to say. Yes, of course, 
we ought to go to church as a habit. But we should also learn to pray, to meditate and to read our Bibles. If we really look hard and work hard at finding God, then we will find him and he will welcome us. Returning to the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, we can see how Jesus cared for those who want to be in his company. The solution offered by the disciples was to send the people away back to their own towns and villages. To Jesus, though, this was an anathema, for he never turns away anyone who has found him. You give them something to eat, he commanded. He cared for each and every one of them, just as he cares for each and every one of us. What is more, just as he fed each and every one of them with plenty left over, so we will find an abundance in his love for us. Jesus was then alone in prayer with his disciples nearby. Much of the time he was surrounded by the crowds of people and he would have continually been busy teaching and healing. However, we learn here the importance of some private, quiet time in prayer. We all need to find some time to be on our own, in relative silence to pray and meditate, to listen to the voice of the Lord. Also note that the disciples were close at hand, firstly to watch and learn, but secondly to join with the prayers when Jesus was ready. Verse 18 underlines the importance of prayer both individually and as a small group. We can learn from this also the necessity of praying together as friends, as family, with our wife or husband, with our children and with our parents. Jesus asked the disciples who the people in the crowds thought he was, even though, of course, he already knew the answer. He did this to strengthen their own conviction of his identity by showing them the mistakes of others. Sometimes we can be so wrapped up in what we're trying to say that those listening fail to understand our message. It's important to secure the involvement of those to whom we are talking and to draw out some form of confirmatory response. Note that at no time did Jesus say who he was. It was Peter who was to go on and answer the question, and the confirmation from Jesus was his instruction not to tell anyone who he was. But why this secrecy? Jesus continued by explaining for the first time what lay ahead for him, namely his death and resurrection. His path was already ordained, and through the resurrection would come the final conclusive proof of his identity. Until this point, perhaps even the disciples had been confused by the identity of Jesus. But now, having come out and said that they knew him to be the Christ, it was time to explain what that meant. For the time being, however, it was going to be necessary to keep this knowledge to themselves. There would be many opportunities later to proclaim his name to the world. It is certain that without holiness no man can serve God, and that, without self-denial, no man can be holy. And so it must be from the nature of mankind and the nature of Christ's service. For what is man's nature but sinful flesh, and what his service but a sharp corrective? No two powers can be more antagonistic than man's nature and Christ's service, and the struggle issues as either power prevails in apostasy or in self-denial. In the first place, without crossing and denying of self, there can be no purification of the moral habit. Without true compunction and the tender conscience, purity of heart and the energy of a devout mind set free from the lure of evil, no man can have fellowship with Christ, and no man can have these without self-denial. <clears throat> so again, even with those who have for a while followed Christ's call, how often do we see the fairest promise of a high and elevated life marred for want of constancy? They had no endurance, for they had no self-denial. A self-sparing temper 
will make a man not only utter a contradiction to his law, but even to himself. Without self-denial there can be no real cleaving of the moral nature to the will of God. I say that to distinguish between the passive and seeming attachments of most baptised men, to the conscious energetic grasp of will by which Christ's true despite disciples cleave to their master's service. We need to ask ourselves, in what do we deny ourselves? It would be hard for most men to find out what one thing in the manifold acts of their daily lives they either do or leave undone simply for Christ's sake. And if we cannot find anything in which we deny ourselves already, we need to resolve on something in which we may deny ourselves in the future. In things lawful and innocent, and it may be gainful and honourable, and in keeping with our lot in life. And such things as the world, by its own measure, esteems necessary things. We may truly try ourselves, and we may find matter for self-denial, and that in many ways. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds follow you the only God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.